Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second in our series of virtual curator spotlights from Cooperstown, side of the Baseball Hall of Fame. We're very glad that you could join us today. Uh, today is April 15th, 2020. It is Jackie Robinson Day uh, throughout not only the major leagues, but really across the entire baseball world and spectrum. Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Marcus, and I work in the education department. Today, we're going to be talking with Gabrielle Augustine. Gabrielle is a curator at the Hall of Fame. She'll be discussing uh, Jackie Robinson's legacy, uh, also talking about some of the work that uh, she and her uh, other her fellow curators are doing in putting together some changes, some revisions to our Pride and Passion exhibit. Yeah. which uh, is on the second floor of the museum. It's the exhibit about the history of African-Americans in the game. Our museum does remain closed for uh, the immediate time, but we certainly hope that's going to change in the near future. Uh, we want to officially uh, welcome Gabrielle to our virtual curator spotlight. Gabrielle, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Bruce. Always a pleasure. I've, uh... Yeah, you know, it's, it's 73 years since Jackie Robinson made his major league debut. It was April 15th, 1947. And yep. some people might say, boy, that's a long time, and people are still talking about this. Uh, why is it still important, Gabrielle? Why is this something that um, we need to talk about, we should be talking about, even as we get close to 75 years away from it? Well, because if Jackie Robinson had failed on April 15th, 1947, the world would be really, really different. Uh, both baseball would be a very different game. Uh, and then American culture would be very different because the civil rights movement would not have had as many of the, much of the grounds that it had to, with his success to keep building on. Uh, and so it's hugely important and there's still changes that are happening and that it is still a relevant day today. And that's why I think that that's why Major League Baseball celebrates him, you know, every year with everyone wearing the number 42. Yeah. This year, not able to do that. No games no. are taking place, but Major League Baseball are doing some things online. And of course, yep. we at the Hall of Fame doing this program and uh, we'll be doing other things uh, at uh, both our education Facebook and at the Hall of Fame Facebook page. Uh, Gabrielle, here, uh, a picture of Jackie uh, early in his professional career. It's a photograph from 1945, not the Jackie that we're used to seeing with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, this is Jackie, uh, one season that he played in the Negro Leagues. Tell us more yes. about this. Yep, he, uh, uh, he played one season with the Kansas City Monarchs. He actually played shortstop. Uh, we know him for playing uh, first in his first year with the Dodgers first base, but then he moved to second. But yeah, he actually played a season at shortstop. Uh, and this is where he was playing for when uh, Branch Rickey's scout, Clyde Sukaforth, found him. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, this is where it all started. Started the ball rolling. Played just that one season. Uh, his season ended, I think, in August because of injury. Prior to that, as you mentioned, he was interviewed by Clyde Sukforth, who'd been sent by Branch Rickey, batted 375 yeah. for the Monarchs that year, did play shortstop, as you mentioned, such a versatile player. He could yeah. play short, second, first, third, outfield corners, just a remarkable athlete. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was a, uh, what was it, a, he lettered in three sports at UCLA, three or four sports. Yeah, he just, he was all over in athletic ability. Yeah, he played baseball, basketball, football, also was a standout in uh, track and field as well. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, one of the great stories about Jackie is from his time in the U.S. military. Yes. Uh, this is a photograph from uh, around 1943, 44. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that he's wearing his lieutenant's uniform. He did become a lieutenant in the U.S. Army yep. during the war. Mm -hmm. And there's a terrific story that actually connects him with a future pioneer, Rosa Parks. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, Jackie was actually drafted in 1942 into the Army. Um, and at that time, the Army was still segregated. Uh, so he was actually with an all African-American unit. Uh, but the uh, event that you're talking about, Bruce, is that, and this is actually something I've learned fairly recently, 
uh, that in 1944, uh, Jackie Robinson had a Rosa Parks-like incident. Uh, he was getting on a military bus and uh, the driver told him to sit in the back, even though there were seats still open in the front. Uh, Jackie stood up for himself and said, and there was actually an argument. Uh, it actually got taken to military court, um, but, and then, but Jackie got acquitted of, of, on all charges. He was found not guilty. Uh, and so, but this was about a decade before Rosa Parks. Uh, it's similar, similar circumstances of, you know, being told where to sit, but, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting that, that I had no idea this did really have happened until not too long ago. And so it's a really, it's a, it shows him standing up for what's right and really showing that character that I think Branch Rickey was looking for. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story. It's not that well known, no. uh, even though it's, it's been out there for a while, but it's not talked about that much. You know, he could have backed down. He could have just gone to the back of the bus, but he did stand up for himself. It was not a, a physical confrontation, no, but no. apparently got very heated verbally yeah. and mm -hmm. um, led to him being arrested. He went to a military tribunal, a military court, and um, there the verdict was rather convincing. Yep. Yeah, he was found completely not guilty yep. on all the mm -hmm. charges. Correct. Um, just supporting what he had done, showing that he was in the right. We're pretty sure that Branch Rickey knew about this, and this was yet a, um, yeah. a, another factor in him um, wanting to sign uh, Jackie. He looked at Jackie for a number of different reasons, not just as a great athlete, but uh, highly intelligent. Also how he would... mm -hmm. Yeah. Go right yeah, ahead, Gabriel. He handled himself on and off the field. Yeah, a man of character, um, uh, well-spoken, um, went to UCLA for three years, didn't graduate, but did go uh, to class for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, such a well-rounded per person in so many different ways. Um, yeah. That brings us to his debut. It's April 15th, 1947. Uh, yeah. Jackie makes his debut for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Tell us a little bit more about what happened that day. Well, um, like I said, it was uh, with everything that Branch Rickey was doing with signing Jackie Robinson, it was called a the great experiment for a reason, because if this experiment did not work, uh, then, it, like I said in the beginning of the program, it, American history would, have lo would be looking a lot different right now, and so would baseball. Uh, we would not, there would not be the steps of uh, equality that we have we have reached uh, and still trying to you know continue and uh, get better ourselves um, so but April 15th itself as everyone might imagine uh, there's a, probably a bit of pressure on Jackie to perform uh, he's probably a little nervous uh, he didn't do great offensively he uh, but he did get a sacrifice hit um, but he also you know starting at first he made 11 putouts so he didn't do too badly um, and then, uh, actually, uh, two games later on the 18th, he actually hit his first home run. So he, he mm. kind of settled into the groove of things. Interesting. He played first base. We tend to think of him as a second baseman. He yep. eventually mm -hmm. would settle in as Pee Wee Reese's double play partner. But mm -hmm. that first season, primarily uh, a first baseman, again, underscoring the versatility that he brought to the field. When he yep. did play second base, he put himself uh, in the line of fire, so to speak. Here's a photograph yep. uh, of an opposing player. We don't know who it is, but it was a player that came in with his spikes high. Potentially, this was being done intentionally to try to hurt Jackie. Mm -hmm. uh, one of many travails that he faced during that yep. first season, players on other teams that didn't necessarily want him there. No, yeah. I mean, he faced prejudice throughout his career. Um, and it's, it's crazy to think the amount that he was thrown at, not just so, yes, he was facing, you know, people sliding into him on the field, but he also, you know, people, the pitchers could throw at him whenever they wanted to when he was at the plate. And they did so intentionally because they were trying to prove that if he retaliated, that he couldn't make it in the big leagues, that African Americans couldn't take, didn't have what it took to make it in the big leagues. Um, but he never fought back. Uh, instead he fought back in a, uh, quiet manner, you know, when he got on base, he stole second, and then, you know, he would likely steal third, and he would probably steal home, too, and so uh, in his first season, the first two months, we have, uh, in our Hall of Fame collection, we have what are called day-by-day -day books, for those who mm -hmm. don't know what that is, 
that those are the early uh, ways of how stats were recorded for each player that each day after the game, you know, line by line, you know, how many hits, how many runs, how many putouts they made. Uh, but they also, they have a, a section for hit by pitch. And in the first two seasons of 1947, Jackie Robinson was hit seven times, you know, that's mm -hmm. unheard of. And, but that doesn't even count all the times that he was thrown at and he got out of the way. Um, but after those first two months, the pitchers started figuring out that he was a danger in terms of, you know, for the game and that he would go and score runs. Mm -hmm. And so the pitchers actually figured out, oh, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't really, you know, maybe I should try and strike him out instead of just giving him the first base. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he, for the rest of the season, he only got hit two more times over the next couple of months. And so, you know, I mean, still nine being hit nine times is a lot, but uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting in those day by day books, you can show where the, uh, uh, where it was concentrated and that tapered off. They learned quickly that this was not yeah. a smart strategy uh, with Jackie Robinson. Right. And as you mentioned, you know, he could not charge the mound. That wasn't something done all that often anyway, but uh, if he felt angry about it, if he felt it was intentional, and there were a couple of times when he was thrown up and in near the head, he was playing really in an era before helmets became uh, widespread. Um, despite all this, um, he could not retaliate. Uh, was not supposed to say anything to the pitcher, just had to take his base and, oh. and move on from there. Yeah. Even more dis disturbing, Gabrielle, the letters that were sent, yep. not only to Jackie Robinson, but also to Branch Rickey, the mm -hmm. president and part owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, we have in our collection at the Hall of Fame, and there's a copy of it in the current Pride and Passion exhibit, Yep. This was a death threat that was sent to Jackie. We don't think it was from 47, his rookie year. We no. think it was probably a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to read sense. it out loud, get your reaction to it. Uh, start with the left side, the first page of the note. Uh, it says, note at the top, we have already got rid of several like you. One was found in River just recently. The letter goes on to say, Robinson, we are going to kill you if you attempt to enter a ball game at Crosley Field. And then you see at the bottom, uh, the Travelers is the signature. The Travelers, we believe, were a racist group somewhere in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing that that was their, the symbol, the three stick figures that you see between the words the and Travelers. I want to ask you the question in this way, Gabby, because a lot of people probably don't know, you play baseball, yep, I you're do. a pitcher, you're pretty yep. competitive. Yes. You know how hard it is to play the game under normal, ordinary circumstances. Not an easy game to play, especially at no. a high level. No. To think about somebody like Jackie Robinson having to play the game at the highest level of competition and having to be concerned with things like this, knowing mm -hmm. there are haters in the stadium, Knowing yep. the possibility, the danger that you're being put into, in spite of all this, he apparently played in this ball game at Crosley Field. Nothing happened. The Travelers no. never followed through on their threats. But put yourself in that place as someone who plays competitive baseball. How do you do it? How do you approach that? I couldn't. I couldn't imagine the stress that Jackie Robinson was under. I, uh, it, it, like you said, baseball is a hard enough game mentally, physically emotionally uh it, it you've got to put all of it to concentrate you know hitting a you know a round you know spherical object with a round bat is not the easiest thing in the world and so on top of that you ha have in the back of your mind that there are people out there that hate you i can only imagine the mental strength that jackie robinson must have had to be able to even go out there and be able to play and not you know give up the game because the, of potential someone taking his life so and i think he, he, he is an amazing individual for even being able to do that. And I, you know, that's why I think that's why we celebrate him to this day is because he, he was managed to do this and he succeeded even with all the odds that get stacked against him. We do believe he played this game and mm -hmm. um, don't know exactly how he did in the game. No, but he I don't did know. not yeah. back down. He did not give in. He put himself in harm's way based mm -hmm. on the threat. 
Um, and when people found out about that, they, I think, began to admire Jack even more for what he did. Now, we do have in our collection as well some positive letters, because he yeah. did receive some letters of support. Mm -hmm. Here is one from a fan named Carl M. Vining. On the left is the actual handwritten letter, written in cursive. On the right, we've transcribed it so that we can read it a little more easily. Dear Jackie, I've never written to a ball player before, although I've been a fan for 20 years. I am simply an American who is ashamed of the things my race has done and is doing to your race. We are all Americans, created equal, and I'm sick at heart of the things that are happening. You have been a credit to your people and have taken more than I could in your place. Uh, just wanted to wish you all the luck and happiness for you and your family in the years to come. Again, uh, from a fan, uh, Carl M. Vining. Why is it important, Gabby, that the Hall of Fame present both the positive and negative letters that Robinson received? Uh, I think it's because it shows that there was there was support. Um, I think you always it's always helpful to balance out the uh, good and evil. Like you know, you have both sides of the story because it, you know you can't want, you don't want to say that everyone is against him. Uh, you want to show that you know there is you know you want to show both sides of the story that yes there are people who did want him here and that who wanted him to play and wanted him to succeed. As a player yourself. If you receive a letter like this, contrasted to that awful letter that we saw a moment ago, I don't know that this letter erases that, but maybe it makes your life a little more bearable when you take the field. Oh, definitely. I definitely, uh, knowing that there are fans who have your back, well, it definitely helps. I mean, you know, when you have fans cheering for your team and want you to win, then it makes the game a little easier. It makes, you know, it, it, you know counteracts, you know, anything on the, on the negative side. Let's talk about his relationship with the great Pee Wee Reese, shortstop. Um, Jackie did come up as a first baseman with the Dodgers. That was the position of need in 47, but he would eventually move to second base. That become more or less his full-time position. He and Reese would form a, a wonderful double play combination. More importantly, though, they would become the best of friends. We had a white man, Pee Wee Reese, from the South, from Kentucky, Mm -hmm. grew up in Jim Crow segregation, and yet kind of put all that out the, out the side, was able to put that out the window in terms of opening his arms to Jackie Robinson. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it shows that people can change and that people didn't always believe that the segregation was right, even if they came from the South where the Jim Crow laws were the most prevalent. Um, and I think their friendship is a, is a great thing. I think that helped Jackie a ton. Uh, having, making, having your, knowing that your teammates have your back uh, is definitely really important. And, you know, in, in experiences of me being the only female on the, on my baseball team, you know, well, knowing that my teammates who are all boys, you know, around my age, you know, growing up, but just high school boys and knowing that they had my back, if something was said, you know, it didn't happen often, uh, but if something was said about me being a girl or whatever, they had my, my teammates had my back. And so the same with Jackie here, like having, you know, Pee Wee having his back was, is in incredibly important. And the fact that they were friends on top of it uh, makes it even more special. Now there's a famous story that some have questioned whether it's true. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, it could have been in 1947. It may have been at Crosley Field in Cincinnati. Other people say no, it was in 1948. It might have been in Boston when the Dodgers were playing the Braves. Um, it may have been in Philadelphia, may have been in St. Louis. So there's some dispute as to the exact time and place. Mm -hmm. But the story is that Robinson was playing first base on the road and was really hearing it from the fans. I mean, he yeah. heard a lot of bigoted comments, a lot of insults on a fairly regular basis. But this day was particularly bad. Yeah, He was feeling down about it. Reese, who was playing shortstop, looked over at him, saw his body language, indicated that he was not feeling good, and apparently took time out, went over to speak uh, mm -hmm. to Jackie, put his arm around Jackie's shoulder, said something to him. We don't know exactly what. It may have been words of encouragement, may have been a joke. We, we're not exactly sure. Some, as I said, have questioned the story. I happen to believe the story is true. Rex Barney, a former Dodger, says it's true. 
And Jackie Robinson himself wrote about it in mm -hmm. his autobiography. And I see no reason why Robinson would have fabricated the story. You mentioned your own situation, yeah. Yeah. playing baseball, only female on, on male teams. Have you ever been in a situation where you heard taunts and hoped that a teammate might help you out? Uh, it was never, I, I don't, I can't say I've ever faced anything nearly as uh, harmful and uh, verbally abusive as what Jackie faced. Um, and, uh, I, but I, I can't say there was any specific uh, event where someone had to come over and have my back. Um, you know, there are times when I'm, you know, as a pitcher, you're not, you don't have a greatest game. And so for me, there is definitely the uh, feeling of, oh, you know, oh, she's just a girl. You know, she's, she's not going to succeed. You know, oh, no wonder she can't throw or, you know, throw strikes or whatever. So it's nice when, you know, you have your teammates behind you in the field cheering, say, oh, you got this, the next guy. You got this, you know. Um, and so in, in that, yeah, it's. In some, in, I guess in a similar way, more modern way, but nothing, I don't think ever, I've never faced anything nearly as bad as what Jackie Robinson had to face. Yeah. And, you've, yeah. heard, you've heard comments, but certainly mm -hmm. not to, to that level. No. Um, a teammate never needed to come over to you. I guess you would have been happy if they did, but yeah. it was never so bad that you felt you needed that. And we don't know right. if necessarily Jackie needed it. it, it, it in the short term, uh, he wasn't feeling good. I don't think there's any question in the long term, he still would have been a highly successful player, but it does show something about Reese's character and this, this great relationship between uh, two standout players and two standout men as well. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie would retire from the game in the mid 1950s. At one point he was actually traded to the New York Giants, but he informed the Dodgers that he did not want to go to another team, play for another franchise. Um, he felt that he was declining as a player. He had some physical problems. Um, he was a diabetic that was starting to have, um, take a toll on his body as well. Mm -hmm. And even after his playing days though, he remains very active in the civil rights movement. I wanna get your thoughts, Gabrielle, on this great photo. Uh, when I first started working at the Hall of Fame way back in 1995, I worked in the research center up on the second floor of our mm -hmm. uh, Giamatti library. And um, I'm trying to remember this, if this picture is still up there, but I know it was there in 95 and I had never seen this picture before. It, it just stunned me. Uh, Jackie on the right, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. on the left, and then learning yeah. about their relationship. Your thoughts on seeing a photograph like this? I, I mean, it's two icons standing with each other. It's fabulous. It's actually, uh, I believe, I'm not sure if it's still on the second floor, but I know there's a version of it down in our uh, photo archives, uh, it, hanging on the wall in the office. Um, but yeah, it's, and I love the quote that goes with this, this photo. I mean, it, it obviously not necessarily said at the same time, but the fact that Martin Luther King gave Jackie Robinson so much credit because, and you know, in a way, credit, given where credit's due because again if Jackie Robinson had not succeeded it would not have the civil rights movement would not have had the extra assumption to keep going forward it would have been it would have taken some steps back which I think would have been you know it would have not good been good for the civil rights movement um and so but the fact that he Jackie succeeded it it paved some some other way for Martin Luther King to do what he was doing in the you know, 50s and 60s. Um, and I, I think it's great that they became friends and that, you know, Jackie was so supportive of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I was reading that uh, Jackie Robinson was there the day in DC when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. Mm. Uh, so I think that that's incredibly cool that he's in that crowd, you know, pretty nearby to where uh, King is talking. The moment of the photo is great, too, because Jackie is clearly talking. Martin Luther King is listening to him. Uh, the leader of the American Civil Rights yep. Movement of the 1960s, uh, listening to a former ball player and his experiences. Mm -hmm. And the quote, Jackie Robinson made it possible for me in the first place. Without him, I would never have been able to do what I did. Uh, a powerful quote. When we do these programs for students and schools around the country, we usually end our program at this point because it is a very powerful quote, but we're gonna proceed a little bit further beyond this 
we do want to talk about the exhibit that partially is the story of Jackie Robinson, but also goes beyond that. It's our Pride and Passion exhibit. It's on the yep. second floor of the museum. Mm -hmm. um, you can see also in the lower left-hand corner uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers cap uh, that Jackie Robinson wore. The cap is not currently in the exhibit, but is in our collection and I believe is in storage uh, at the moment. We're going to talk with Gabby about uh, some of the ongoing changes and some of the interesting features to this exhibit. Mm -hmm. In terms of what is there right now, Gabrielle, this is always an artifact that jumps out. It's very small. Mm -hmm. It's a small ticket. You have yeah. to look carefully when you're in the exhibit. But boy, it tells a powerful story. It does. Uh, this is uh, from circa 1953. Uh, and this is a colored ticket to an Eastman, Georgia baseball game. So a minor league game. Um, and so this is, you know, 1953, this is, you know, six years after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, and yet there's still segregation happening in the, you know, in the United States. And so, you know, the uh, African Americans had their sections that they could sit in, and the white people had their sections they could sit in. And so this ticket just tells, you know, as like you said, it, it's about, you know, two inches by two inches. Um, it's very small, but it, it's, it's showing that story that, just because baseball is making strides in equality, the rest of the country is still a little bit behind. Uh, and Jim Crow laws weren't completely disbanded until the 1960s. So it's, it's incredible how, how slowly, slowly that change happens. And the ticket makes it very clear that it is something that would have been sold to an African-American fan. They, of yep. course, use the word colored on the top part of the ticket and also on the, the tearaway part at the bottom. Uh, so an African-American fan in Eastman, Georgia, 1953, would have been sold this ticket. Very likely would have sat in uh, probably a section in the outfield okay. with other African-American fans. White fans would have been sold a different ticket. They likely would have been seated probably toward the infield in better seats. So that is currently uh, at that exhibit. Yep. We do have some changes that are in the process of being made. Uh, Gabrielle is heading up those changes. One of them involves the addition of this really great movie poster from 1950. Tell us about it. So uh, with, within the changes, and we'll show you in a couple slides, uh, we're, one of the things that runs through this entire exhibit, um, because it was the first exhibit at the hall to talk about baseball and its relationship with American history uh, in how much, it, because it was so intertwined, we actually did, uh, and when the exhibit first opened in both uh, 1997 then was uh, redone in 2005, uh, there was a timeline that ran through it. And so there are parallel timelines, one focusing on baseball history and the other focusing on American history with focus on civil rights movements and, you know, those key, key moments there. Um, but we're re actually redoing the timeline so that uh, it's bigger, brighter, bolder, uh, with some different entries, and uh, including uh, this uh, a image of this poster, the Jackie Robinson story, story which is an actual film uh, that came out in 1950, uh, and it starred Jackie Robinson him, as himself. Uh, so he's mid-career, and he's starring in a movie about him making the majors, which is very cool. Uh, and it actually was uh, well, pretty well received for the fact that, you know, how segregated America was, it was pretty much, it was pretty well critically acclaimed, uh, which is pretty awesome. And Jackie, according to most of the reviews, is, is pretty solid. Obviously, um, he kind of knew how to play himself, but his, right. you know, his acting skills were, you know, probably above average for yeah. somebody that did not have any experience making film or television appearances. Yeah. Uh, also stars a very a fine actress, Ruby D. I believe she played Rachel Robinson mm -hmm. yep. in the film. And um, I, I have not seen the whole film start to finish. Me neither. But I've seen snippets of it and generally read positive reviews. Mm -hmm. Yep, same here. Now, another interesting item that's going to be added as well is this baseball card of a lesser known player, Pumsy mm -hmm. Green. Tell us his story and how this ties in to Jackie Robinson in 1947. Well, so obviously April 15th, 1947 was the day baseball was integrated, but not all baseball teams were integrated right away. It was not a 
the flip of a switch that it happened. Uh, it wasn't until 1959 when the Boston Red Sox signed Pumpsy Green and that he made his debut that actually all of the major league teams had featured an African-American baseball player in their roster. Uh, and so that's over a dozen years after Jackie Robinson, you know, that's how, again, how slowly that changed. And it was, it's, it's still changing. It's still growing. Like it wasn't until 1962 that Buck O'Neill was signed as a Cubs coach, uh, as the first African-American to be a major league coach. Uh, in 1966, Emmett Ashford was the first African-American umpire. In 1975, you had Frank Robinson as the first African-American manager. And then it wasn't until 1983 that we had the first African-American GM with Bob Watson. Uh, so it's still, it's still changing and it's still making those strides forward uh, for equality in baseball. The card, I think, is from 1960, correct? Yes. Yeah, the so. season after Green uh, debuted. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a middle infielder, didn't have a great career, but um, was a very decent ball player. Uh, but yeah. put in, in difficult circumstances as, as that first man to integrate the Boston Red Sox. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, you mentioned earlier the timeline and how that has uh, or is going to be changed. Uh, mm -hmm. So when the museum reopens, people will notice this. We have some mock-ups of what the, the new timeline will look like. And as you mentioned, it's going to incorporate um, actual American history along mm -hmm. with baseball history as well. Yep, because, you know, things like, uh, you know, World War II, where, you know, there were troops that, you know, both, you know, white and African Americans were serving. And so that was still, it wasn't just white troops going over, it was still a major thing for African Americans, including Jackie Robinson, uh, to go overseas. And so to talk about how it all interacted and how, you know, in uh, I believe it was uh, 1948, when President Truman started beginning, began the desegregation of uh, the troops that that started changing. So that's an important part in civil rights movement that also affected baseball. It, it, it's all intertwined, which is why we wanted to talk about both of those uh, because they, they affected each other of how they're, what things were happening. One thing I noticed here on the lower left side of um, the, the kind of the baseboard where the timeline is, that's an mm -hmm. image of Moses Fleetwood Walker. Yep. He was actually the first African-American to play what was considered Major League Baseball back in the 1880s. And when we talk about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, Jackie was the first African-American player of the 20th century. So there's yes. a link there yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Here's another view uh, of what it's going to uh, to look like. Yep, yep. Uh, our uh, one of our graphic designers put put this together for me, which is awesome because I think we're featuring it and talking about it in one of our memories and dreams upcoming either issue number two or three this year. Uh, so that we're talking about these timeline changes and the updates, and uh, we're bringing it to present day uh, up to 2016 with the new Smithsonian opening uh, that's focused on African American history. Uh, so again, the history is continuing to be made. Now you mentioned to me that this is a recurating of the exhibit, but there will be a more significant makeover coming up in 2022. Tell us yes. what's going on with that. Yep. So in 2022, this is the goal. You know, obviously things change, uh, but the, the, our goal is 2022 with the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. We want to redo Pride and Passion. Uh, we want to redo this exhibit uh, completely, basically tear everything that you see in there down and start from ground zero and start and work your way up. Um, and uh, so it, sh it will probably look very different than what it looks like right now. And that's about a, a two year process. So we are in the very early, early beginning planning stages, but it's more like throwing things on the wall, you know, and seeing if the ideas stick uh, kind of thing. So that, that's where we are, and that's our goal uh, to uh, to make it to make it uh, brand new and uh, bring it up to date. The current exhibit actually began in 1997, and that was the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of Jackie Robinson's Major League debut. So again, coming up the 75th anniversary, uh, and the uh, the exhibit, as Gabby said, will look quite a bit different. Uh, we're going to start taking your questions via our chat room in just a moment. We do have a couple more slides to look at. 
Gabrielle, uh, there's actually two different Hall of Fame plaques for Jackie Robinson. There are. One is in the plaque gallery. Uh, the other currently is not. Why the two plaques? Well, uh, when Jackie was first inducted uh, in 1962, um, he, uh, he wanted to get into the Hall of Fame, not based on what he did with, with breaking the color barrier. He wanted to be in the Hall of Fame for his baseball abilities and be voted in based on his baseball abilities. Uh, and so his first plaque uh, did not set, mention anything about breaking the color barrier and uh, integrating baseball. And so it wasn't until uh, 2008 that uh, with uh, permission from Rachel Robinson that we actually recast and redid a new plaque for him talking about those major the, the major moments. Uh, and so, yeah, we have both plaques. The, uh, the second plaque is the one in the plaque gallery. The other is in storage right now. But with our recuration of friend passion, maybe it'll make an appearance up there. We don't know. Very interesting. The uh, new plaque at the very bottom um, has a complete sentence about Jackie's impact as a civil rights pioneer. Some of the other text also redone, but the, the, the real significant change is that last sentence acknowledging uh, Jackie's role as a civil rights pioneer and an American hero as well. So that is um, the bulk of our talk with curator Gabrielle Augustine about Jackie's legacy on this Jackie Robinson Day and also some of the changes going on with our Pride and Passion exhibit. We do have a few minutes left though. We do want to take some questions for Gabrielle. Uh, we have about 350 people joining us today, which is terrific. We welcome everybody, no matter where you are. Now, one of our fans, Jose, tells me, happy birthday to Gabrielle. It's your birthday today. It is. It is. <laughs> you kept that a secret. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to advertise that, but yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it's a pretty great day to share. Uh, yeah, Jackie absolutely. Robinson day. Yeah. All right. So we cleared that up. Happy birthday to Gabrielle. We have another fan, Howard, who is asking us, before you end today, my daughter, who is watching, was wondering about the women's uniform that is in your Zoom background. Uh, Howard will tell you about it. This is a replica uniform for the Chicago Colleens, Chicago, Illinois, a baseball team in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Uh, the AAGPBL, as we call it, existed from 1943 until 1954. Uh, this is not an actual uniform, a skirted uniform worn by one of the players, but it is a replica, and we typically use it as part of our uh, backdrop. At the Hall of Fame in our Women in Baseball exhibit called Diamond Dreams, we actually have authentic skirted <laughs> uniforms or tunics, as they're called. I think there's three of them in the exhibit right now. Uh, so they actually, those were worn by the players. Um, these are, are replicas, costumes, and sometimes we'll um, have staff um, uh, who can fit into them, wear them uh, for different special events. I've and worn it is them. Part of the backdrop here. I've worn one. I've worn that one actually. And as a baseball player, I don't know how <laughs> women played in those because it, it is such a short skirt, and those shorts that they wear underneath would do nothing at all for sliding. Yeah. Just putting that out there. <laughs> Not very comfortable, but no. um, somehow the, the players in the All-American League uh, persevered in spite of that. Yep. Uh, let's take a look at some more questions. Uh, we have Brian who wants to know how did Jackie die and how old was he? Um, if you'd like to tackle that, Gabrielle. Uh, he died in... It was 72. 72. I think yeah. uh, there was no, I think it was natural causes, if I remember correctly. Um, and I would hazard a guess that uh, stress probably played a large part in that with having the, the decade that he played baseball and dealing with that stress all those 10 years probably contributed to that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. He, he had a heart attack, a massive heart attack. His health had been declining because of diabetes. But a lot of people, and I agree with Gabby, that um, the stress of being that first player, uh, a lot of pressure on him to succeed, which he did, but also the hatred, the bigotry. We saw the death threat earlier. Uh, the toll that it must have taken um, had to be pretty remarkable. So probably a combination of diabetes. And back then, the 
treatments for diabetes, not as advanced as they are today, but probably a combination of that and the stress and anxiety uh, dealing with what he did. Um, not easy, it was not easy at all. Um, let's see here, we have um, a question actually about baseball cards. Uh, are Jackie Robinson's baseball cards hard to find? Do you have any in the museum? Um, I could answer yes to both of those questions. I don't know specifically, Gabrielle, which Robinson cards we have. Do you know which ones we have? No, I don't have the inventory memorized off the top of my head. Um, and I can't go into work and check that for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are at least a couple. We do definitely have a couple, yes. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're not that hard, they're not that easy to find. Um, replica is a little different situation. Topps has made a number of Robinson replica cards over the last 20, 25 years, but you know, authentic Robinson cards in good condition, not very easy to locate. Remember Topps did not start producing cards until 52. Mm -hmm. Robinson started playing in 47. So there may be some early Bauman cards but in terms of Topps cards, uh, they only would have produced cards for him from 52 to 56. So probably not a lot of original Topps Robinson cards out there. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions. Would love uh, for you to discuss the role of one of my personal heroes, Clyde Sukforth, and that's from Daniel Evans. You did mention Sukforth earlier, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. Yep, well, he was the scout that Branch Rickey uh, sent to find a, an African-American player who would fit what Branch Rickey thought would be a good fit to integrate Major League Baseball. And uh, Sukafor found Robinson and believed that he was the man for the job. Sukafor was a highly respected baseball man, and uh, he basically gave Rickey a very favorable report, and that was good enough for Branch Rickey. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we have uh, John Ferreira, hope I'm pronouncing that right, not with a question, just says, I like when the exhibits get redone, we visit every year, it's good to see the changes, so we look forward to John visiting us in the near future. Uh, see what else we have here. Uh, this is a question from Doc Curry. I don't know if that's a nickname or an actual doctor, but Doc Curry wants to know, how is Larry Doby represented in the Hall of Fame along with Jackie? Um, is Doby currently featured in Pride and Passion? Uh, we actually, I'm not even sure we have any game used artifacts by Larry Doby. Um, we do talk about him, uh, but he is, uh, he, yeah, he is the lesser known uh, uh, color line breaker uh, because he was the first African-American in the American League, but uh, later that same year in 1947. Um, because, and it's hard because we don't have any artifacts to help tell that story. I know we do have, I think it was from 2008, the Indians, which he played for, who signed him. Uh, we do have uh, a jersey from one of the Indians players in 2008 when they did a very similar uh, Jackie Robinson-esque day, but for Larry Doby, where they all wore Larry Doby, Doby's number, uh, which we do have that in our collection, but that's not on exhibit right now. You know, Larry Doby is an overlooked story. And one mm -hmm. of the things I've been told by sports writers from that time period, maybe some later sports writers as well, Larry Doby essentially went through the same kind of bigotry, faced mm -hmm. the same kind of hatred as Jackie Robinson. Nobody really talked about it. Right. Um, they felt it was kind of a repeat of the Robinson story, but Doby was facing a lot of the same abuse during the same time frame. He signed, I think, only a couple of months after Jackie did, uh, joined the Indians in the middle of that 47 season. Yep. Uh, and his story is a critical part of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take one more question for our curator, Gabrielle Augustine. This is from Tab Bamford. What is the most unique Jackie Robinson artifact in the Hall of Fame collection? Any thoughts on that, Gabrielle? Hmm. We do have his silver platter he received from his, one of his all-star games that he played in, which is pretty cool. It's always neat to, uh, I, one thing, you know, I love what kind of, seeing what kind of bling uh, major league players get. That's a whole other side story though. But uh, with the all-star game, every year, everyone who was named to, to the team actually received some sort of 
trinkety type thing. Uh, and each year it differed. You know, sometimes there's a cigarette box, uh, other times there's platters, and we do have a platter uh, that was given to Jackie Robinson for his participation in one of the All-Star Games. I can't remember which year right off the top of my head, uh, but it is, it's pretty unique in the fact that it's not, it's not game used. He didn't use it on the field, but it's a, it's a recognition of him. Excellent, excellent. Uh, great information today, Gabrielle. We really thank you for joining us, offering some thoughts on the legacy of Jackie Robinson, 53 years to the day that he made his Major League debut. And yep also giving us some hints as to what the Pride and Passion exhibit will look like in the near future. Thanks uh, for your time today. No, oh, not a problem. It was a pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for everyone for watching. Again, Gabrielle Augustine, uh, one of the curators at the Hall of Fame and really the lead curator on our new Pride and Passion exhibit, which will be completely redone uh, on the schedule for 2022, two years from now. We thank all of you, over 300, for joining us for today's program. This is part of a continuing series. We're going to be doing one later this month about our Shoebox Treasures exhibit, a relatively new exhibit about baseball cards that opened up a little bit less than a year ago. It was uh, Memorial Day weekend of 2019, okay. so we'll be talking about that with curator John O'Dell. So, Always check out our website and our education Facebook page to find out about these programs. We plan to do these virtual curator spotlights uh, for the coming weeks. We're also gonna be doing Voices of the Game virtually, and we're gonna be offering uh, weekly free video conferences. Uh, we actually have one scheduled uh, for tomorrow and that will be on the subject of cultural diversity. Thanks for being with us here in Cooperstown on Jackie Robinson Day. Have a great day, everybody.